Ano? Ito mago po sa inyo lahat. Uh, first, uh, my greetings to the PAJ. And muna-muna si Roman Floresca, National President. Uh, also, the PAJ Calabarzon led by Adjani. Of course, the UK Administration uh, led by uh, Dr. Bobby. Now, climate change is a very complex subject. And first, our work at Erie has a lot to do with climate change. And uh, we'd like to say that at any time, we can help with information, we can help with data, we can help with any question that you may have. Please, please don't hesitate to ask. And uh, we'll happily provide as much information as we can. And the people to contact, first and foremost, are Tony Lampino. Tony, please stand up. Although I'm sure they know your face, but it's easier to contact Tony. He is head of Erie Communication. And if you can find Tony, you can always find uh, Ayi. Please. And uh, uh, she's a key person in the communication group. And if you just can't find either Tony or I.E., uh, please contact uh, Mono Riveros. <laughs> Mono Riveros, uh, we work together very closely so in my office. So anytime, please call. My cell phone number is 917-812-4383. So anytime, <coughs> need anything, please call us if we can help. Okay. Now, I was told by Johnny that we have a very mixed group here. Uh, working journalists, uh, members of uh, the uh, government agencies, uh, students, some local officials. So I thought it would be a good idea to provide an overview of some of our work and some of it has to do with climate change. And if you have any more questions later on, we can help supply more details. So, just the basics. First, ERI is an international organization. We were founded in 1960 by an agreement between Ford and Rockefeller Foundation and the Philippine government. And we are sitting on UPLB land. We lease the land on agreements with the Philippine government, and specifically the UP system. And essentially, if Erie goes away, then everything reverts back to the UP system, particularly UPLB. We have been in partnership with UPLB since 1960 very important partnership that resulted in the Green Revolution, that resulted in the star in staving of starvation across the globe in the 1960s and 70s. We have 1,350 staff from 35 countries. We have Russians, Chinese, Indonesians, Vietnamese, Europeans, South Americans, Africans research team. Roughly 300 PhDs, all studying about rice and the environment around rice. I was talking to one of the younger scientists the other day, Amelia Henry, and her specialty is the hair on the root of the rice plant. That's her specialty. And, and her entire life is dedicated to studying the hair on the root of the rice plant. It's very important because it's how the rice plant gets nutrients from the soil. And if we understand how the hairs on the root of the rice plant behave in various environments, drought or heat, good soils, poor soils, plant nutrients, pests, then we can grow rice better. 
such specializations are found at the end. Our headquarters is at UPLB here, and we also have offices in major rice growing countries across the globe. The impact of the research since 1916. This was an independent analysis of the impact of Iris research, and fundamentally, the conclusion was that it will benefit of one and a half billion dollars per year across the rice growing world. And if you look at it on a country basis, on a per hectare basis, benefits to farmers, uh, roughly $52 per hectare per year in the Philippines and over $70 per hectare per year in countries like Indonesia and Vietnam. We are an autonomous international organization. We are not part of the UN. We are not part of the Philippine government. We are not an NGO. We are somewhere in between UN and NGO, somewhere. We do have a treaty that's ratified by the Philippine Senate and 29 other countries. So, I just turned it off. I should have done. Okay. We have a lot of hungry people. And even these days, almost a billion. And when prices change, like in the rice price crisis, a lot more got hungry. Kung nagmamahal ang bigas, parang pinababago na rin ang sweldo ng mga mayroon. Kasi karamihan sa atin, kanin lang kinakain. Kung nagmahal ang bigas, then nagmamahal ang buong buhay natin. And in our country, based on recent surveys by social weather stations, you still have a lot of hunger. Almost 70.2% of the population say they missed a meal in the last few months. And 4.1% say they're hungry all of the time. And look at this. This is very interesting. Basically, what the story it says is that ang presyo ng bigas sa Pilipinas is two to three times the price of rice in Vietnam and Thailand. Napakamura ang bigas sa Thailand and Vietnam. So obviously, we can import, and importers can make a lot of money because they bring in the rice, they sell it at the high domestic prices, and make a lot of money. And there's a lot of incentive to smuggle. Why? Because foreign rice is cheap, domestic rice is very expensive. And kung may pumapasok na bigas, pinapatawan natin ang tariff, 35% in quota, 50% out of quota. Ito doble ang presyo ng bigas. So if you escape the tariff by smuggling, you make a lot more money. And even if you're caught, the benefits of smuggling are so great that you may as well pay the fine or bribe somebody. You will continue to smuggle because the incentive to smuggle is very great. We like rice. All of us, we eat a lot of rice. But actually, if you look at it, there are more countries who eat more rice than we do. Philippines, 120 kilos. Global average, 65, including America and Europe. Myanmar, more than five kilos, five sacks of rice per head per year. I can't even carry one sack. But we're eating this much per head per year, man, woman, child. That's a lot of rice. So we expect that we need at least 112 million more metric tons of rice to be produced by the year 2040, when our population would have gone about 130 million already, at least. And here's the history. Philippines. Thailand, Vietnam, in the 1960s, we were roughly the same. Now, total, 
19 we're producing. It's been growing every year. Thailand and Vietnam are producing a lot more. Now, why is that? Part of the answer, of course, is that we've been also producing a lot more people. So, it's really not a time to go on about that, guys, if you want to go on about it. Sabi ni Mayor Perez dito sa Spanish, marami tayong ginagawa araw at ganyan. So population is a major issue. We've got a lot more people to feed. In the 1970s and 80s, we were roughly the same size. Now we're at least one third larger than the other countries. And if you look at rice, it's a normal good. Normal good means when our income grows, we eat more. So when we have more income, we buy more rice, we eat more. Our families in particular, we eat more rice. Uh, when your income grows, all of a sudden you get new relatives in your household. So your household eats a lot more rice. And we can see clearly here, urban and rural, you compare ordinary rice and NFA rice. Indeed, as our income grows from Q1, the poor, to Q5, the rich, we eat a lot more rice. And NFA rice is not very popular. It's really the regular rice that's more popular. After all, NFA only reaches roughly 12% of the population. The rest of the population eats regular rice. And this is a real important fact. Harvested area means we have land and we can multiply the number of times we use it by irrigation. Harvested area. So Thailand and Vietnam, they have invested a lot in irrigation. And as a result, they have a lot more harvested land than we do. So irrigation is a crucial thing. A farmer can plant twice, maybe even three times. And as a result, Thailand and Vietnam have been producing a lot of rice. This is our country. These are the areas planted to rice in green based on the satellite imagery that we're able to get. You can see that most of the rice is still grown in Central Luzon. Central Luzon is still the rice bowl of the country. And Central Luzon is the most vulnerable because of typhoon. Yolanda hit us. But it did not hit Central Luzon. So there was not much impact of rice. Glenda hit us. It hit Southern Tagalog. There is a little rice in Pico area, but not very much. Central Luzon is a real problem for rice if a typhoon hits Central Luzon. Now, our country is one third rice, one third corn, one third coconut. Actually, we're a very diversified country. We are more diversified than Thailand or Vietnam. Thailand or Vietnam is 50 to 60 percent rice. Being diversified is a good thing. But we have to take care of all the three crops in the same way as we take care of one. Most of our work is in rice. But who's taking care of coconut? Who's taking care of corn? We know that not enough work is happening in coconut. Just look at the coccolisa example. When coccolisa hit us, nobody knew what to do. There was no agreement. Even here at UPLB campus, professors were fighting about what to do about coccolisa. Science would have provided the answer. But you need to invest in science to have some answers. So indeed, while the coconut industry is large, and we're still number one in coconut production, we're not investing in coconut research. So when coccolisa took place, we didn't know what to do. Thankfully, Glenda came and blew all the coccolisa away. So climate change can have a bad effect. Climate change can also have a good effect. We're thankful that Glenda came and concluded the Kapolisa voyage. 
Valley Hills, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, roughly the same in the early years. Very different now. But no, our yields are actually higher than Thailand. The big difference is that they have more land devoted to rice. And this is part of the story. Take a look at the points, especially up here, in the latter years. Between 2009 to 2014, the Philippines was the fastest growing country in terms of rice yields. Fastest. And I um, openly say that I attribute this to the much greater attention that the administration of Secretary Alcala has put on rice and research over the last three or four years. Fastest growth in rice yields across Asia. We have 2.4 million Filipino rice farmers. Average farm size 1.1 hectare. And we continue to import rice. Three reasons. Demographic, more people to feed. Less land devoted to rice. And it's cheaper. I always talk to my mother-in-law. And I ask her, does she care whether or not the rice she buys for our household comes from Vietnam or the Philippines? No, she doesn't care. What she cares about is that it's cheap. Price is a major factor. And if it's one-third the price of our local rice, buy it. And these are cost and return numbers. By the way, uh, we're sharing all of this information freely. Uh, it's okay to copy the presentation. This is cost of return figures. You can do the analysis later. But clearly it shows why we import from Vietnam. Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, let me see a good number to show. In Vietnam, the price of rice is 19 cents per kilo. The price of rice in Vietnam is 35 cents per kilo. It's about half. So Balpuri, Thailand is 40 cents per kilo. So we import a lot of rice from Vietnam. And here's the real problem. Globally, rice yield rate growth has gone down. It used to be a little over 2%, now it's only 1%. We have big problems in resources, and we have problems in climate change. Temperature, rainfall, sea level, weather hazards. Global warming is a real phenomenon. We've been tracking weather patterns in our own rice uh, Erie weather station. And we can tell you that on the average, temperatures have grown by at least two degrees over the last 40 years, two degrees. And we can say that on the average, a one degree increase in temperature leads to a 10% fall in rice yields. One degree temperature up, 10% yield down. Very serious. Sea levels are rising, depending on your climate scenarios, anywhere from 20 centimeters to as high as 60. We look at the rice growing areas across Asia, and the green areas is where rice grow. 90% of the world's rice is grown in Asia. And we look at the Mekong region, and we know from our satellite data that we have available, and we share with the DA, based on the European Space Agency satellite, with 12 day, one image for 12 days, 20 meters square resolution. We know that the rice growing areas are in blue. The 
the flood, salit prone gut and low lying areas are encircled. And if there is global warming and sea levels rise, these are the first areas that are going to be flooded. The rice growing areas. And there are also the drought prone inland areas in Yelp. So climate change is a problem because it enhances issues with abiotic stresses. Submergence, a total of 20 million hectares affected. Salinity, at least 10% of the rice areas in these countries, causing 12% of the loss per year. Drought, 23 million hectares affected. And in many areas, multiple stresses, a combination of heat, submergence, salinity, and drought. So what are we doing, Nadine? We're doing research on rice ready for climate change, for drought, salinity, submergence, and heat. And it's all based on what's in the gene bank. And uh, lots of you will be folks here. How many rice varieties do you think there are? Yes? 10,000 here going once. I see a good friend, a stalwart of the Crop Science Society here, Frank Hilario. <laughs> Frank, how many rice varieties do you think there are? I don't know, 1,000? 1,000. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> you have 127,000 varieties of rice stored in the gene bank. No rice variety will ever go extinct because of the gene bank. It will always be there, available for grow, growing, available for research, available for farmers all over the world. Go to the website of IRI, select the rice seed you like, we'll send it to you for free. For research purposes. Not for trade, for research. The cutting edge of the research, however, is projects like this, long-term projects, 15 to 20 years. Changing the anatomy of the rice plant so that it is much more efficient. C3 and C4 are photosynthesis processes. How does the plant convert sunlight and nutrients into food? C3 is rice. C4 is like corn. Corn is a much more efficient plant than rice. So how do we breed rice that behaves more like corn. Let me go back to corn. Our country is one-third rice, one-third coconut, one-third corn. Do you hear anybody complaining about corn? Nobody. Why? Because in the last 20 years, there's been large private sector input into new varieties of seeds that can withstand many of the stresses that have an impact on corn. And corn farmers are doing very well. And the Department of Agriculture is even talking about exporting corn. We have problems in rice, we have problems in coconut, we have no problems in corn. So we're trying to get the rice plant to behave more like corn. That's really very long-term research. We also have some marino rice can withstand flooding for up to 21 days. This is the variety that's now being distributed in the Yolanda hit areas. When the rice plant is hit and it's under the water, what it does, it goes to sleep. And when the water subsides, it wakes up again. This is what happened with this farmer in India. His farm was flooded. His friends told him, forget it. Blow it under. But he was trying out the new submergence tolerant variety, and a few months later, he got a good crop. This is now available to 10 million plus farmers across South Asia and Southeast Asia. We're also working with varieties that can withstand more than one stress, because farmers don't know whether or not they'll be hit by a drought or they'll be hit by a flood. They don't know. They can only pray, like we all do. So we combine, we combine the, uh, the traits in one plant 
So there's like crop insurance for the farmer. If he's hit by a drought, the plant can withstand it. If it's flooded, the plant can withstand it. This is swarma, a variety popular in South Asia. The breeding approach is take a variety that is already popular with farmers and improve it. Improve it with submergence tolerance, improve it with heat tolerance, drought tolerance. We also work with mechanisms that save water. This is alternate wetting and drying, AWD. Farmers have a simple tool like a, just a pipe, a tube, a can, a plastic, a plastic thing that enables them to look at the moisture content under the soil. Measure it so that they don't have to flood the field. The, the bonus is it reduces water use by about 30%. So you save water, you don't have to flood the field. And then there's an environmental bonus. The environmental bonus is that if you apply this AWD, you get a reduction in greenhouse gases. All of this available to the public for free. The Rice Knowledge Bank, which in fact Johnny helped start when he was working at ERI a long time ago, is still operating. All of the research results of ERI are available to anybody. Go on the website. If you're a teacher, there are lesson plans and teaching materials. If you're a student, there's data that you can use for your analysis. If you're a journalist, there's a lot of information that you can use to read. And if you find that the information on the REST Knowledge Bank is lacking, call us, call Tony, call I, please. We work in a partnership globally with 900 other partners across the globe. We're also working to build a new generation of ASEAN rice scientists. We need young scientists. Right now, we have about 275 scholarships for young scientists. At ERI, we have about 65 postdocs, young graduates, because they're producing the new science that will enable us to withstand all of these issues with climate change. In the program that we're proposing to ASEAN and working with ASEAN, there's training and extension to build a new generation of ASEAN rice scientists. There are very few agronomy enrollees in the UPLB now. Very few. There are many more DEFCON, Papa uh, Ramirez right there. There are more DEFCON than agronomy right now. Yes. So we need a lot more agronomy. We need a lot more plant breeding. We need a lot more crop science. So, if you have a chance, please uh, visit with us just down the road. Anytime, call us ahead. We'll welcome you. Uh,